Okay, welcome to the UEI Technical Masterclass. I'm Bob Finn with UEI. I hope everyone here is doing well this morning. Today's webinar is entitled Next Generation HIL SIL Hybrid Test Bench Solutions. Our presenter will be our own Bob Judd. Bob is the Director of Business Development here at UEI. And in this masterclass, he'll describe the latest generation of SIL, HIL, and hybrid test bench products and how they help you, the system designer, build a powerful, efficient, and price-effective solution. As always, I want to remind you all that our webinar, all our webinar attendees, that this is an interactive environment and we encourage you to ask questions. So if you've got a question, send it our way using the webinar chat tool. And that wraps it up for my introduction. And without further ado, I'm going to hand this webinar over to you, Bob. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for your time. At UEI, we do quite a lot of work in, in Hill and SIL and hybrid test bench solutions. Um, and we thought, you know, many of our customers might, might appreciate a little bit of info from, from what we learned and what we've seen. First thing, if, if, if you're on this, this call, you probably already know what these things are. But when, when we say HIL, it's, it's an acronym for hardware in the loop system. SIL is a system integration lab. And a hybrid test, HTB is a hybrid test bench. And, and the, the general idea is it allows you to test system functionality on a bench rather than in the actual application, be it an aircraft, a car, a boat, or, or any kind of other deployment. And um, they can be totally simulated or um, we have a lot of applications where, say, for example, in an aircraft, we use a, an actual LRU for parts of the simulation and totally simulated on the other. So that's kind of where the, the hybrid terminology comes from. So kind of comparing the hills to sills to HTBs, people kind of have their own definitions, but, but based on our own ex experience, the hills we find um, more commonly used in, in automotive power plant applications. And also a hill as opposed to a sill is probably more likely to be a system optimization optimization tool rather than a, a go, no-go tester. Um, SILS we, is a real common term in, in aerospace applications. And uh, as I, you know, kind of alluded to before, it's, it's more likely a test system, you know, does it work than an optimization tool. And HDB, hybrid test bench, um, it's not a, a term commonly used in Europe, but uh, I mean, not, not a term commonly used in the United States, but, but very commonly used in, in, uh, in Europe where I guess the, the Hill and Sill acronyms may not match, um, you know, local languages. So, so why, why would someone go through all the effort to create a Hill or a Sill? And, uh, um, you know, you can see this, and this is actually a relatively simple one, but you can see it's, you know, there's a lot of involvement in, in building a system like this. Um, you know, why would you do it? So the, probably the, the first, um, the first reason most people build hills and sills is it, it saves money. Um, you don't have to use very, very expensive, deployed systems, you know, LRUs and, you know, avionics equipment and things like that um, to, to do your testing. Um, and so, you know, saving money is always a good thing. And, and possibly even more important than saving money is it, it saves time. It allows you to build things um, uh, quickly and, and test things quickly. And also it allows you to, to test things before you know, before you possibly even have the, the aircraft or car, or whatever it is you're simulating available. So you can run, you know, basically run all your system tests before the vehicle um, your system's gonna run on it has ever even been built. So, you know, why, why simulate? Well, you know, one of the reasons we, we find in, you know, especially in our uh, aviation, you know, aerospace and, and, and in particularly space applications is, you know, it, it reduces the likelihood of an oops event. You know, you don't, you, if, you, if you find a problem in your, in your sill or hill station, um, you know, it could conceivably, um, you know, avoid a, a disastrous event in 
the uh, you know in the in the first deployment of the actual vehicle. So it also allows you to test things outside normal operating envelopes. You know there may be tests there are tests you can run in a sill that you would never do in an actual aircraft because it's not safe. And um, the simulation also uh, simplifies a, the ongoing testing of future revisions as you make changes to the, uh, the, the system, you can test it in your sill and make sure everything works again before you try and, and uh, put, put it on your vehicle. Um, it also simplifies human factor testing. You can, you can put someone in a, in a sill or a hill and let them play around with it, um, and it's pretty inexpensive. If you want to test things like um, uh, you know, aircraft response or, or uh, tactile feel response in a, in, a, in a system in an aircraft, well, it's awfully expensive, but you can do it in a sill. You know, once the sill is built, the operating costs are pretty low. So a typical block diagram, um, usually there'll be a controller CPU, a couple of interconnect panels, um, then either simulated or actual I.O. devices. And then connected to those, there's monitoring and test equipment. And then one of the, one of the things that uh, we'll, we'll chat about later, but the, the interconnect panels turn out to be um, a fairly significant part of the system because they, they, at least historically, they've been hardwired and they make it somewhat difficult to switch in other devices where, where lately we've, and we and, and other customers too, have a bunch of switch panels that, that allow you to wire things in and switch from device to device. And so you can simulate different systems all in the same cell. So the components, of a typical system, there's a controller, you know, CPU, whether it's simulated or actual, could be a real ECU from a car, or you know, just a, a, a Pentium computer with, with uh, you know, with, with the software running on it. There's a bunch of I/O signals that are interfaced to the controller, the interconnection panels that we chatted just chatted about, a series of I/O devices, and the the monitoring and, and test and control computer, which is usually but not always different than different than the, the primary computer so the controller cpu in an aircraft it's usually called a flight computer in an automobile it's called ecu or uh, ecm and in power plants um you know it's usually called the, D, the dcs host um, and again these can be real or simulated Things to consider, you know, when, when you're picking your, your controller, you know, get one fast enough to, uh, to, to sim, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not using the actual unit, get one fast enough to, uh, to do everything you need to. And, and usually that's not a problem because usually you, you, you can get just a, um, a laptop or a, or a you know, a, a, a rack mount CPU that has a lot more horsepower to it than the deployed unit, because usually deployed units have to be ruggedized and things like that. And so they don't always have access to the latest, greatest Pentium multi-core. Um, make sure you, you support all the IO signals that are necessary. You know, we, we kind of say, you know, no, no one wants to go to their boss and say, I've got a great solution for this system and it does 96% of the IO we need. Um, you know, you need you need 100% of the I/O. So, you need to pay attention to the the CPU's operating system. So, you know, especially in um, in the avionics world, we you know we find a lot of a lot of systems using uh, VXWorks and QNX and and uh, you know, not too much Windows, although you do see it periodically, and then then quite a bit of Linux as well. And uh, programming, people you know like to, to match what's used in a real CPU, make it as close to the actual deployed CPU as possible. Um, we find a lot of people are using Simulink as a tool. Um, and then you know pay, pay attention to the effort required when you're going to port your simulated code to the real host because because that's a that's a big effort and there's a lot of testing involved there too. So, 
switching gears a little bit from the computer um, to the type of signals that, uh, and in particular IO signals that, that you need to interface through. And there's thermocouples, RTD, strain gauges. I won't read you the whole list, but uh, um, you know, quite quite a a, a wide selection. Um, one one of the challenges in sills and hills is that you not only need to be able to measure from these devices, but typically you also need to be able to simulate them. So, you know, in the case of a uh, thermocouple or an RTD, lots of people make great systems that'll measure temperature with the thermocouple or RTD, but your, your selection of the number of systems that can actually simulate a thermocouple or RTD um, or, or any of the other signals. Um, is, uh, is is quite a bit uh, smaller, and so you know again need need to be careful that you can you can do all the signals you need in both directions. So thermocouples, I mean the the two primary challenges in thermocouples is that you know they're the output voltage is small. They're you know depending on what what. Uh, type, you know, it could be anywhere from 10 to 80 microvolts per degree C. That's a pretty small signal. And I always have to worry about cold junction. Without going too much into thermocouple technology, um, thermocouples created when two dissimilar metals are, are attached together. And, and as the temperature changes, the voltage across that junction changes too. But anytime you build a, sim, uh, a thermocouple system, you create a uh, a cold junction or basically a, a spurious thermocouple where you connect the, the actual sensor to your measurement system. And if you don't compensate for that cold junction error, then you basically get a one-to-one -one, um, error in your system. So if your cold junction is off by two degrees, well, your, your measurement's going to be off by two degrees. So, you know, based on the cold junction and the fact that um, a lot of standard A to D boards, you know, don't have input ranges that that are, you know, very useful at measuring 10 microvolt signals. Um, you have to be careful to uh, to make sure you get a, a board with enough gain. So, a couple of things to pay attention to in thermocouple applications is um, it's important to have real realistic expectations in in, in both directions. We see a lot of people, um, they come to us and say, you know, I have this great thermocouple system and, and you know, I want to measure it to 0.1 degree C, you know, accuracy. And the reality is it's almost impossible to do that. Um, to try and get better than plus or minus a degree C is, is pretty, un pretty unrealistic unless you're doing a lot of special things. Um, First and foremost is that uh, most of the thermocouples you buy are nowhere near as accurate as plus or minus one degree C. If you go through the specs of them, even even you know the better grades of thermocouples um, will, will seldom achieve one degree C. And then the system's only as good as the cold junction sensor you're using. And again, as I mentioned before, if there's a one-to-one -one error in, in your measurement signal with error in cold junction. And so you know those those sensors are, you know, are, are part of the area equation. Um, you need to be a little bit careful by e even something as similar, as simple as a breeze um, generated by somebody walking by, because that can that can impact the cold junction measurement. Um, other things to worry about is, you know, how 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 fast your system needs to run. You know, temperature doesn't change very much. You don't need to run your 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 thermocouple A to D board at 10 kilohertz if if the time constant on your thermocouple is, is half a second. Um, on the simulated side, um, you want to make sure that uh, you, your simulation system can um, test or can simulate an open um, an open thermocouple. And um, really, most most thermocouples look like a short, so so there's not much way to test if if you have a short, and, but um, um, but you certainly can test to open TC. 
And do be careful with your grounding. Um, if your system's using isolated thermocouples, you want to make sure your simul simulator does the same thing. So without trying to avoid being too promotional, but we, we do want to tell you a little bit about what we offer uh, for thermocouple solutions. We have the, <clears throat> the, uh, the DNA, DNR, DNF series TC378, which is a uh, thermocouple simulator, and the AI212, which is a thermocouple measurement board. And they, they both offer eight channels, if, you know, sub-degree C accuracy, automatically take care of, of the temperature uh, cold junction problems. Both are, are fully isolated on a channel by channel basis. They both will um, either measure or, or simulate open and, and short circuits. Um, uh, you know, they, they will run up to a kilohertz, although, you know, um, seldom required to run that fast. And uh, like all of our products, they do, they do come with a 10-year availability guarantee. And, and that's, you know, a fairly important thing in many sills and hills um, because these things have a, have a, you know, typically a very long life expectancy. If you build the sill around an aircraft, well, the aircraft may last 20 years. I mean, I think the F-16 was... Um, released in the early 1960s. I think the, the B-52 is as old as I am. And there's sills to support them. And so you don't, you don't want to, you know, make your sill based on a, a piece of equipment that, that might be obsolete in five years because, you know, then, then you know, what are you going to do? You're going to have to redesign it. And it's a, a time-consuming and, and expensive um, operation. So an RTD solution, um, an RTD is a, um, a resistance output device, but you can, you can kind of cheat and simulate an RTD with an output voltage. Um, these are typically inexpensive and can work quite well. But if the, the device you are using um, has any kind of self-test or excitation current um, tests, then, then the voltage output will, will almost certainly show up as an error in the signal. So um, many, many times you really do have to simulate an RTD with a variable resistance device. So and then there's programmable potentiometer devices and there's switch relay network devices and it's kind of advantages and disadvantages of both. We kind of more more typically um, pushed or lean towards the switch relay networks because the units are very stable. You can, you can get very high resolution. Um, if, if, they're, if they're based on mechanical relay switching in different resistors, they, you know, they can be life limited, but um, these days there's, there's enough great semiconductor switches that, uh, that new boards at least will, will typically not have mechanical relays on them. So, so, um, so consider when, when you're looking for an RTD simulator, make, first of all, make, make sure you know what RTD you're simulating. Uh, um, you know, the two, two most common by far are, are 100 ohm platinum and 1000 ohm platinum. And uh, in, in kind of general industry, the 100 ohm um, is is much more common than a thousand, but but the thousand does have the advantage that it it, it has a little bit um, larger output scale factor, so you you can get finer measurements. Um, and yeah, we we see a lot of the um, the thousand ohm RTDs in, in cryogenic usage where they're measuring, say, in, in a in a rocket, you know, the 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 liquid oxygen or or other. Um, Cold, cold liquids, liquid helium in the in the ballast area. Some RTDs are pretty fragile, so you really want to make sure you can simulate an open circuit. And since there's always wiring involved, you probably want to make sure you can simulate a short circuit as well. And um, and, and and as always with, with many of these signals, um, have realistic expectations on measurement speed. Don't try and specify something that runs at a kilohertz when a really fast RTD 
um, at least in air, we'll have we'll probably have a uh, uh, a response time of you know a second or more. So, as you might expect, UEI does have uh, an offering both to simulate and and measure. RTDs again. I don't won't go into a lot of details, but you know we have multi channels. They you know they handle the the most common thousand hundred ohm. Um, we we can detect shorts and opens, and uh, um, oh, we also have have some from readback capabilities to make sure that um, the excitation more than anything is 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 working correctly. So so not only can we can we simulate the uh, the uh, the RTD, but we can also make sure that the excitation current is where it's supposed to be. So strain gauges, um, things you need to watch out for is the resolution. It's it's and 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 often that will be good enough, but but there's a surprising number of of strain gauge solutions out there that are still 12 bit. Um, so that you know, one part in 4095 is is uh, you know may, may be a problem depending on on what accuracy and resolution you need. You need to match the excitation voltage limits to your system. Um, if your excitation is AC, check the system bandwidth and and just check in general to make sure the strain gauge measurement or simulation system you use will work with AC because some won't. Uh, there's quarter, half, and full bridge configurations. Make make sure you're you're getting a system that matches again matches what you're going to deploy, and uh, this also has to do with the wiring. You can do two, four, or six wire measurements. Again, make 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 sure what you what you simulate is is going to match what what you're actually putting on the the aircraft, the rocket, the the car, whatever whatever the the application is. So. Synchros and resolvers. Um, we see we see um, a surprise. It's a, it's an old technology, and originally they were was designed just so that you could rotate something in the cockpit of an aircraft, and you'd get the exact same rotation somewhere else in the aircraft. So, so you know, a pilot could could rotate a small knob in. in uh, in the cockpit, and you know that that could move a, a gun turret, um, you know, somewhere else in the aircraft. Now, most of the systems we have um, are not direct control, but but we measure or simulate synchros and resolvers, um, and they're they're quite common in in a lot of a lot of aviation applications. They're, they're kind of expensive devices, so we don't see much in in the automotive world. But I think you know you still might run into one here or there. So. Um, there's really two two kinds of of devices here. There's a the synchro with three wire and a common resolver with a four wire. They're they're similar, but again, you need to make sure what whichever system you're you're going to to install will match what you have in in the vehicle. And then there can be internal or external excitation. You have to watch out for the ex excitation frequency and voltage in aircraft. A lot of times that's the standard 400 hertz power supply, but in other applications, um, it can be anywhere from seen as low as 50 hertz and as high as five kilohertz. Uh, make sure the resolution is what you need. You know, again, just go go through kind of on spec by spec and just, just make sure the device you're looking at to either simulate or measure um, in your system will uh, will provide the the the, um, the accuracy you need so a couple of other notes um, most most systems are designed to do input or output um, and will will provide uh, excitation reference or or um, is capable of running off off of um, and external, but but do need to check again. As I mentioned earlier, most of the aerospace is 400 hertz. Um, 28 volt RMS is is the most common of the voltages, but there's there's also a fair number of higher voltage 90, 150 volt RMS systems out there. Um, there's as I mentioned, this is an old technology. Don't be surprised if if digital system you're you're replicating or simulating only has 12 bit resolution. 
may or may not be sufficient, but but more than likely it is because you know you're measuring typically rotation in you know forty thousand ninety five different um, you know ang or you know re resolution in in a in a rotary device is you know is actually a pretty small uh, pretty small angle, um, and uh, in your measurement systems, do be careful about isolation. Because um, the real signals coming off uh, synchros and resolvers are almost always isolated because they're coming from coils. Um, if your system is not ready for that, then, or if your simulation system is not providing isolated outputs, then uh, you, you can have grounding problems. So, and we have, a, you know, as you might expect, a, a variety of uh, solutions for synchros and resolvers. I won't go through them here, but you know, you can visit our website or call one of our our applications engineers, and they they can certainly help you select the most appropriate solution for your application. So, and then a similar, but but um, but quite you know similar kind of in in scope, but quite different in technology, is uh, RVTs and LVDTs. Um, they, you know, the RVDT measures rotor, rotary motion. The LVDT is, is linear, um, and these are these are originally designed for as sensors. They they measure rotation or they measure, you know, linear displacement. So, if you're simulating these, the excitation is almost always provided by the host or the measurement system. Um, power required is is typically less than synchro resolvers, kind of a rule of thumb is seven volt RMS and 350 uh, or yeah, um, 0.35 VA is, is typically plenty. Excitation frequencies tend, tend to be a little higher than synchro resolvers, but one thing you have to you may watch here is that the sensor accuracy is is typically specified at a frequency, so you want to make make sure that you can you can run at the frequency that that the the sensor is planning on. Um, again, there's a lot of 12-bit converters out there that are probably sufficient. So applications, um, the the RVDTs uh, abound in in aircraft cockpits, whether it's the throttle controls or or um, it's seen them on um, rudder pedals, and uh, you know a lot. A lot of times they're they're designed as as a human interface. Um, the LVDTs and RVTTs can can be pretty inexpensive, so so you see them a lot more these days than you do synchro resolvers. Um, in the automotive world, you don't see them very much anymore because they're they're a lot more expensive than the digital devices, um, and. We have a couple couple of solutions for for our VDTs and LVDTs too. So, switching gears, there's a a lot of sensors out there that are designed to produce zero to twenty or four to twenty milliamps, and so it's important that your SIL or HIL be able to both measure and produce zero to twenty and four to four to twenty milliamp outputs. Um, you know, it could be measuring. Or, or um, control and pressure, vacuum, temperature, RH. I mean, almost any atmospheric factor um, can be measured with a, a four to 20 milliamp sensor. So considerations you wanna think, um, these devices can either sink or source current. You wanna make sure you, you pick the right direction. Um, and, um, you know, resolution and accuracy, like, like most, most um, excuse me, most, most measurement devices, you wanna pay attention to that. And again, wiring is always um, a, a consideration in the reliability of these systems. And you, you probably will want to be able to simulate open and short circuit conditions because they're, you know, the type of tests you want your SIL to be able to um, emulate and, and see how your, your control system, you know, reacts to wiring failures. So we've got a, a wide variety of, of um, milliamp input and outputs. The 318 acts as a current source while the 319 acts as a current sink. And the 204 is, is the input device and it, it, it will measure um, sinking or sourcing current devices. So 
a little bit move, moving on to more kind of obscure interfaces. There's a fair number of rare devices out there. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, make make sure the system you're you're developing around um, gives you a solution for everything. You don't want to you don't want to go to the, the program manager and says I just built this great sill and it does everything but measure rotational speed. Um, you know you need you need to provide a hundred percent of the solution. So so some of these devices are you know variable reluctance at speed and that's that's what I was just talking about where it's basically uh, var a variable reluctance sensor is is a is a coil basically attached or or not not attached but but put adjacent to a gear and the gears on a you know on a rotary shaft and every time a tooth goes by the the, the coil it generates a pulse and by counting those pulses um, and you know and measuring the frequency of those pulses um, you you can determine RPM and so you know it's a very common non-contact way to measure rotary speed um, and then there's generic straight frequency outputs um, we don't see a lot of it but but we do see some some requirements for AC analog outputs and VRMS outputs there's motor drive signals and there's also a, a, a fair amount of pulse width modulation requirements out there so you know keep keep track of these and just again make make sure that uh, the system you're about to implement will will implement all the, um, the kind of more obscure interfaces you, you plan to use and then there's always you know communications interfaces and you know the first one we normally talk about is is avionics you've got a rank 429 which is kind of the the primary um, communications bus in commercial aircraft a rank 708 453 which which is used often in, in weather radar and ground proximity warning systems uh, a rank 664 and AFTX is is a relatively new system that's being in, installed in some of the newer aircraft um, most mostly commercial. Mill standard 1553 is kind of um, the A ring 429 for the military. Um, it's dual redundant, so so they run cables in in different areas. So if, if one cable is is uh, is damaged, uh, the system keeps going. And then A ring 825 is standard CAN, and A ring 629 659 is is pretty much custom to the Boeing 7077, but uh, there may be other applications for it that I'm not aware of. So other communication signals, um, you know, in automotive, there's CAN, LIN, um, FlexRay, which we're seeing more and more use of, especially in high speed, high reliability systems. Um, it's, it's used a lot in, in the new, um, uh, steer and brake by wire systems and, and, and in particular the the new um, uh, automated driving systems and most and ODB2 is, is really common it's pretty much underneath the dash in every automo in, in, in every uh, modern automobile so and then kind of generic communication signals to, to pay attention to and you know our Ethernet Ethercat RS-232, when I first got into this industry back in the um, early 1980s, people were saying, you know, RS-232 is dead. You know, you'll, ne you'll never have to worry about it. And uh, we still sell a lot of RS-232 interfaces. So and I won't go through each of the other ones, but, but just again, these are, these are things you might commonly see. And then for timing signals, um, we see a lot of IEEE 1588 also called the PTP and that's um it's it's a timing signal where you can you can generate very accurate times and synchronization pulses using using the ethernet so rather than have to build fancy timers into your system or have a gps you can you can do all your timing interface um, over the ethernet cable that you use for for standard um, data communications as well ntp is another ethernet based 
protocol. It's not quite as accurate as, as 1588, but it's also um, easier to implement. You really don't need any special hardware to do NTP. The, you know, the, uh, the real-time clock in your PC probably synchronizes to a, a server somewhere over NTP, and, you know, you can usually get uh, accuracy, depending on a network, you know, anywhere from one to 100 milliseconds, which, which is plenty for many applications. And then iRig um, is, a, is another protocol. There are a lot of different versions of it, but it's pretty common in, in aircraft applications and to a, to a lesser extent, ground, in, ground military applications. And then GPS um, is, is best known for um, giving you position information, but it will also give you time information and a, and a, synchronous, a synchronization pulse, so one PPS um, pulse over even an inexpensive GPS can be matched to universal uh, coordinated time um, to within certainly well 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 better than a microsecond. So it's it's a handy thing to use. So switching gears a little bit to uh, the interconnection paddles, and um, we we have a lot of customers revamping their systems and. They hate their existing inter, uh, connectivity because it's it's almost always based on, you know, someone having to actually wire some things by hand, um, at the very least by moving connectors around or or with mechanical uh, relays, and um, it it makes reconfiguring um, and supporting and maintaining these systems uh, a much bigger burden. Kind of a new technology, you know, it's not, you know, it's not new in the last 30 minutes, but within the past couple of years, um, there's a series of new tiny solid state relays available and, and they're just perfect for uh, building these interconnection panels. They, they have, you know, 100 milliohms of on resistance. They can, you know, switch 60 volts AC or DC, you know, they're not often used for high current applications, but they can switch up to three amps. Um, and they, they, you know, are very high, they offer a very high isolation, so you don't have to worry about uh, ground loops or, or even to a, in, 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 certain, in certain cases, um, um, you know, safety and isolation from power supplies. Very low output capacitance, so they don't screw up your waveforms. And they're tiny, they, you know, take, um, you know, point, point 0.05 of a square inch. Based on input from a, a variety of customers, we've we've come out with um, a number of um, boards that are designed specifically for interconnect panels on sills and hills. And you can see kind of the, the diagrams there where you connect a flight computer or, or your ECU on one side and then there's three switches and you have independent control of all three. So if you want to connect it to an error signal, um, you know, if you look at the top diagram, you know, you just close the top switch. If you want to connect it to the actual IO module, connect the, the bottom switch. If you want to connect it to a simulated signal, connect the bottom, the, I mean the middle switch, actual middle switch and then simulated signal bottom switch, sorry about that. And then if you want to simulate an, an open connection, an open circuit, then just, just leave all three open. Um, you know, similar configuration on the bottom. And a lot of people may have um, a system where, say, in an avionics environment, you may have an aircraft that, that optionally has a, um, a, a Northrop avionics device in it or a Honeywell avionics device on it. You, you want to be able to test the flight computer um, for, for either one. So, so you can use this kind of interconnect paddle and just with, with your system software, you, you, can, you can determine, you know, whether you connect to the Northrop or the Honeywell or the, the, uh, the Rockwell Collins um, LRUs and, and make things very flexible without having to change any wiring, without having to rewire anything or change any connectors, anything like that. So just a little bit more information on those uh, boards we talked about in the previous slide. So basically, you know, it's a, a fairly, fairly simple, but, but nice dense 
one one by three multiplexer configuration that, that people building um, hills and sills have, have found almost ideal for their applications. So, and then the control and monitoring computer, um, you know, just is there basically to control the test, including, um, you know, and quite importantly, setting the initial conditions. Um, and then it monitors all the inputs, it combines, you know, it, it bas basically tells everything else what to start. And then the sill or hill goes on its own and, and, and does what it was designed to do. And the monitor com monitoring computer kind of watches over the whole thing to see how whatever's being tested has worked, whether there's problems, whether there's, you know, um, everything's working well. And, uh, and also, you know, logs the required data so you can you can provide um, uh, perform a performance analysis um, you know af after the the test. So considerations you know um, you need you need to make make sure that whatever computer you buy has the CPU horsepower you need. Um, you should prob you should pay attention to the operating system. Windows is has um, is used pretty often, although if, if if high speed and high latency is required, sometimes Windows isn't isn't a, a good solution. Linux might be better. And for the most critical real time solutions, you might want to try a, a real time operating system like VxWorks or or QNX. Um, of course, as as always, kind of a common theme in this in this presentation just just make sure that the the computer you're buying or the platform that's going to run underneath it will handle all the IO you need and uh, and as part of that evaluation also will it handle all the IO you need it the time you need um, typically these systems aren't very fast some some automotive systems can run pretty fast but you know most aviation sills run it 50 hertz, 100 hertz, something like that. So, so you know, hi hyper fast computing is not usually a requirement. So, um, other things you may want to consider is uh, there's a growing trend um, to to have multiple CPUs um, and even sometimes. Um, uh, different parts of the sill or hill located in different locations that are all connected together. Um, and a lot of times these are, these are connected by um, some sort of DDS, which uh, DDS is a software application that, that allows each node to publish the data it has and subscribe to data from other nodes. And we're starting to see, you know, a lot of interest in those in hills. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's there's a growing interest to be able to to build your hill and and sill with you know even you know we're work, working with a you know group in Europe that that wants to build part of it in Europe, and then they have another part of the system they want to run that's in in the U.S. and then they have you know they want to be able to connect the two, and do do you know real time system tests even though part parts of the system are distributed across the globe. So one thing just, just want to introduce quickly is, is we're working with a, um, uh, an organization on a, a system called Vistas, which is, is a, a virtual environment designed really pretty much specifically for hills and sills. And it, it does kind of what I, what I described earlier is it provides a, a software interface kind of um, you know, under the, under the table, that allows you to run different parts of the sills um, in different locations, and it's it's starting to it's it's a initially a European um, uh, European based program, but but it's spreading worldwide now. It has huge interest from Airbus, and and so as you might imagine, in the avionics world, if Airbus is interested. A lot of people are interested, um, and it does have some some requirements, but but the the requirements are not, you know, they don't require um, you know crazy crazy 
fast computers or anything like that. They, they just really need to have the software interface that that allows the the systems here and there and you know at, at other other locations across the world to to communicate with each other and and make it look like they're all in the same system. So things things you know things to worry about are software loops and latency and jitter concerns. That's you know that's always kind of the a difficult thing to figure out when when you have different parts of the system in different locations. It's one of the one of the things that the Vistas architecture takes very very good care of. So and also at the same time, uh, uh, both both in software loops and hardware schedulers. Again, Vistas is very good at keep keeping things synchronous in different places. So and then just just a an example we did for. Um, a trade show last year, the trade show this year didn't didn't happen for CV19 reasons, but hope, hopefully they'll they'll run again next year and we'll get to run a similar demo. But just of of Vistas running basically with a with an LRU um, flight computer on the right hand side and uh, uh, a a piece of avionics. Uh, um, God, I can't remember the. The, the artificial horizon on the left hand side. So anyhow, that is um, what I have to talk about today. I hope people found it interesting. Um, and then I think at this stage, um, we'll throw it out to questions. All right, so a question we have, can a, can a, a Cots Hill Sill be as good as an in-house solution? Um, there's always flexibility if you start from scratch to do to do things different in house but but the the, the big trade off there is if if the cot system will do what you need it to why go through all the effort to uh, to build a custom in house system that's going to almost certainly cost a lot more both in time and money and then we'll also have issues um, Trying to maintain it. If you know, if you if you work with a, a cot system and a board fails five years down the road, you just just buy a new one and put it in. Um, if you know, in in our case with our 10-year availability warranty, if you know a variety of components on a board go end of life, um, we have to fix it, right? We we guarantee that we'll we'll redesign the board so so we can give you a plug you know, a pin for pin compatible version that you can just plug in and, and replace. So you don't have to worry about anything going into life we do. Um, so another question, how, how do you balance long time availability with the, the availability of newer technologies? Are our UEI products always backward compatible? And again, as part of our 10 year availability warranty, um, we, you know, we, we promise that that everything you know, if you if you buy a product now, and order the same part number ten years from now, we we guarantee it will plug into to the exact same chassis, um, and and work fine. Um, um, you know, and one one of the ways, probably the primary way, we we, we keep this under control, is we try to. In our, it's kind of in our engineering group. We try not to use highly integrated multifunction components. We like to use jelly bean components. You know, use an op amp and um, drivers and things like that, and put all the intellectual property into the FPGA. So if any one component goes obsolete, you don't have to redesign massive sections of the board. It's easy to redesign a board to change an op amp or to change a, an RS-485 driver. Um, but if if you use more fully integrated things, and somebody um, discon you know and, and the vendor discontinues it, then it can put you in a, a very difficult spot to to ever try and maintain backward compatibility. Um, are synchro still widely used on aircraft? Yeah, no, they 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 definitely st still are, um, and and they are you know expensive and and you know I th I think they they can often be. Um, difficult to find replacements of. I know we're we're working with a customer now that that um, has a 
a, a synchro resolver system on a Huey helicopter. And we're, we're trying to interface to that. And what we tried to do was, was get one in house so that we could model what we're doing based on um, what the customer's doing. But the, you know, the, the unit they're using is, has not been in production for many years. So um, we will probably either have to go there to work with them or have them ship up one of the, the units for their system so that we can, we can work with them from here. There's a, a question that, and I don't, I don't understand. It says, that this, what's the part number and vendor? Oh, maybe to the, to the relay um, we use on the, the, the DNR MUX 414. If you want to send me an email, and my email address is bjud, B-J-U-D-D, at U-E-I-D-A-Q dot com. I will hunt down that information and I'll, I'll, I'll get you the part number of the, of the, the, little, the little relay we use on the 414, 418 series. I apologize, I don't have that off the, the, uh, off the cuff. And I think that that's, that's all the questions I have at this stage. So at this stage, I will just throw it back to Bob, our, our moderator, and thank everyone for your time. And hope you have a great afternoon. And, and I gave out my email address. If, if you have other questions and you, you want to discuss any of that, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Or you can reach out to our applications engineering group, which you can just call our, our phone number at 508-921-4600 and ask for applications. Or just send an email to support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at UEI, once again, ueidaq.com, our, our, our web address. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone for your time. And Bob, I think I will turn the handle back over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Bob. All right, well, this basically concludes today's presentation. I want to note a few things, however. Um, our next master class is going to be on November 19th, which is just in time for Thanksgiving. This particular session will focus on iRig applications. Um, we record every webinar and post the video online, and you can find these archive masterclass videos on our YouTube page or on our own webpage, which is ueidaq.com slash videos. And finally, if you've still got any questions, you need additional support, or you've got a suggestion for a future webinar topic, please email us at support at ueidaq.com or just give us a call at 508-921-4600. We hope you found today's webinar useful. We'll see you again uh, for our next one in November. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Have yourselves a happy Thanksgiving, and please stay healthy.